This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn to Central America, on Monday, Hurricane Iota made landfall on Nicaragua's Caribbean coast as a Category 4 storm just two weeks after Hurricane Eta devastated communities across the region, killing at least 140 people, leaving hundreds of thousands homeless. Hurricane Iota is the strongest November hurricane to ever make landfall in Nicaragua. It left much of the coastal city of Puerto Cabezas without power. Dozens of indigenous communities in Nicaragua and Honduras were evacuated this weekend. This is a resident of Puerto Cabezas who sought shelter ahead of the storm. It was on course to the town and we could die. That's why we have to come here to shelter. I'm now sad because over there, in the Cape, there is nothing to eat at all. All the plantations have come down. Hurricane Iota's devastation comes as much of the Central American region is still reeling from the destruction of Hurricane Eta, which impacted more than three million people, displaced hundreds of thousands of people in Guatemala alone. The back-to-back -back climate change fueled hurricanes come amidst the raging coronavirus pandemic. For more, we're joined by Giovanni Batz, who's been in touch with people reeling from the hurricanes in Guatemala and has been helping coordinate aid distribution, one of the indigenous communities impacted by the storm. He's a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. His forthcoming book, tentatively titled The Fourth Invasion, Decolonial Histories, Megaprojects, and Ishil Maya Resistance in Guatemala. He's joining us from Las Cruces, New Mexico. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us, Giovanni. Describe what is happening right now. Hi. Well, first, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, uh, in terms of what's going on in Central America, um, unfortunately, the news isn't uh, great. Obviously, with the hurricanes, it's caused a lot of damages to, obviously, the most vulnerable populations, which tends to be indigenous peoples, uh, Afro-descendants, uh, and black communities all across Central America. Uh, so right now, um, as a result of the hur Hurricane Eta, uh, there's been communities that have been um, um, in, severely impacted. Uh, there's been communities that uh, have experienced mudslides, roads have been destroyed, bridges have been destroyed. Uh, some communities don't have access um, to the town centers where they can uh, access uh, uh, health care uh, or their necessities. So right now, uh, unfortunately, the reality is grim. Um, on top of that, with, with the pandemic, the government hasn't been responding uh, ad adequately enough, uh, so enough aid isn't being provided to people. Uh, so the situation is extremely concerning, especially now with Yoda, um, you know, hitting Central America now. So talk about how climate change is connected to this mass devastation. Sure. Yeah. So uh, indigenous communities have been warning us that climate change is a real thing, right? And unfortunately, they tend to be uh, uh, indigenous communities tend to be heavily impacted by this. Um, so as a result of deforestation, as a result of, of, of um, increasing droughts, people are finding um, uh, the conditions a, a lot more severe, right? Um, so in the where I work in the Ishil region, a lot of people have argued that um, that climate change has really um, uh, devastated their communities. So the rains are a little bit heavier. Um, this is causing uh, more mudslides, uh, among other things. So um, you know the. Uh, um, it's not just necessarily just climate change as well. It's also the arrival of extractivist industries like hydroelectric plants uh, and dams and mining, which is actually uh, making a, a situation a lot more worse. Uh, so I work in a place called the Ishil region. The Ishil region was heavily impacted during the Guatemalan Civil War between 1960 and 1996. Um, they experienced 114 massacres. Um, and here in the Ishil region, they're experiencing the arrival of megaprojects, which they refer to as the new invasion. Uh, and one of the reasons why they call it the new invasion is because these are foreign-owned, imposed uh, 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 extractivist industry projects um, that, again, create environmental degradation. Um, so right now, one of the things that we're looking at is that governments will propose uh, hydroelectric projects to reduce CO2. Uh, they'll propose uh, uh, hydroelectric plants and dams as a form of green energy. Uh, but when you look at the local situations, these dams, these mega projects are actually causing a lot of environmental uh, damage. So the hydroelectric plant that I look at in my work and in, in that forthcoming book is the Palo Viejo hydroelectric plant, um, and it, which was constructed by an Italian corporation by the name of Enel Green Power. 
Now, Enel Green Power will say that this plan is reducing CO2, producing green energy, and combating climate change. But when you look at the local realities, um, they've actually diverted the rivers uh, through the construction of four diversion dams. Uh, they flooded um, uh, one of the rivers. They've actually contaminated the rivers to the point where after the, the river passes this through this hydroelectric plant, um, the river has been visibly contaminated. Uh, the fish have, have died off. Uh, children who bathe in the river um, come out with rashes, warts, among other things. Uh, uh, these hydroelectric plants, for instance, um, are viewed as a solution for climate change, uh, but indigenous communities will tell you that they're actually causing social division, further militarization, and environmental degradation. So when we think about climate change, we also have to take into consideration these exact extractivist industries and how they're only um, further exasperating an already dire situation. Let's go to Guatemalan President Alejandro Giamate speaking Monday about the impact of climate change and the powerful storms on Guatemala's economy. Every time there is a natural disaster as a result of climate change, we acquire debt. And we have come out to knock on the doors of the generous banks and multilateral organizations that give us higher financing to achieve a reconstruction. This has brought a vicious cycle where we get into debt, we reconstruct, it gets destroyed, we get into debt, we rebuild, and it gets destroyed again. So that's the Guatemalan president. Guatemala, um, uh, Guatemala is also asking, uh, petitioning the Trump administration for temporary protective status. That's TPS for Guatemalans in the U.S. due to the destruction of ETA. Um, can you talk about your thoughts on this? I mean, years ago after Hurricane Mitch, Hondurans as well as Nicaraguans got TPS as a result of the devastation. Yeah, absolutely. Any sort of protections for migrants is, is definitely welcome. TPS obviously isn't perfect in the sense that there needs to be a pathway to citizenship. Um, it tends to be a very ambiguous uh, situation where people, um, you know, live uncertain lives. I mean, Trump is trying to get rid of TPS, and that places people who did receive TPS, uh, Salvadorans and Nicaraguans, among others, uh, in a very precarious situation. So uh, any legal protections for migrants is definitely welcome. Uh, but the U.S. needs to stop deporting people, first and foremost. Um, just in the first two weeks of November, for instance, after at the hit, uh, the U.S. continues to deport folks. Uh, there are 742 people who were deported uh, between November 1st and November uh, uh, 12th. 208 of those were unaccompanied minor, or in other words, 28 percent of those being deported. Uh, so while TPS is it would be it would be great. It needs to be perfected in the sense of, of allowing folks to gain legal citizenship. Um, we also have to help asylum seekers um, uh, at the U.S.-Mexico border. Guatemala itself uh, is morally bankrupt in the sense that, you know, th th there's a reason why people flee Guatemala, right? Uh, it has to do with structural violence, uh, community leaders who are being persecuted uh, for their activism against mega projects, among other things. So Guatemala um, also has to improve um, uh, the situation in, in Guatemala, because there's a reason why people are fleeing. The Trump administration has virtually ended asylum. And when you talk about people being deported, so <clears throat> a number of them have COVID-19. Um, but also, the criminalization of climate refugees, Giovanni. Yeah, absolutely. Again, when we think about climate refugees, um, you know, today in Guatemala, there's a lot of people who are being displaced as a result of these natural disasters. Uh, but unfortunately, indigenous communities uh, and those who rise up to um, engage in social justice movement, fight for environmental justice, um, these are the people who are, are being persecuted. Uh, so in my work, I also analyze uh, uh, community leaders who are, are being persecuted, by, again, by, by the state, by corporation, among other uh, by other um, uh, sources. Uh, I'll provide one example. There's two friends here in Ciudad Juarez, less than an hour away from where I'm currently located in Las Cruces, Francis Francisco Chavez and uh, Gaspar Cobo Corillo. Uh, they were two activists from the Ishu region of Neva uh, who were forced out of their communities due to their activism. So for, for, so for instance, Gaspar, who is an anti-mining activist and, and protested against mega projects, uh, received death threats, right? So now he found himself, now him and Francisco, who was a witness against uh, Rios Montt, during the genocide trial a couple of years ago, um, have, have sought refuge in Ciudad Juarez. They've been there over a year as a result of Trump's uh, stay in Mexico policy. Uh, so living in Ciudad Juarez isn't the best uh, scenario for them. Um, they've, uh, migrants there tend to receive death threats. They're vulnerable uh, to, to, to a lot of um, uh, criminal activity. So unfortunately, 
The Trump administration is responsible for the deaths and the suffering for a lot of migrants um, here in, in, in the, in the U.S.-Mexico border. Giovanni, let me ask you about the incoming Biden administration. <laughs> I mean, under <laughs> President Obama and Joe Biden as vice president, um, though their jargon, their language was extremely different when it came to immigrants, when it came to deportations, they deported more immigrants than I think most presidents combined <clears throat> in the past. Millions Millions and millions and millions of people coming into this country. What do you expect of the incoming Biden-Harris administration? Uh, we have to remember that Biden and Trump are two sides of the same coin, which is U.S. imperialism and intervention, especially in places like in Central America. Uh, while uh, personally, I was excited that Trump um, lost. Obviously, the Biden administration. Uh, we have to be careful. Um, as you mentioned, Obama, the Obama administration, Obama is known as the deporter-in-chief, right, as a result of his reputation within uh, the migrant community. Um, um, but one of the things that a lot of people uh, don't um, aren't aware of is that during the Obama administration, in order to combat uh, migration coming from Central America, specifically unaccompanied minors, um, Biden and Obama designed the Alliance for Prosperity, which was initially a $1 billion um, uh, initiative in order to promote um, security, good governance, and uh, international investment to Central America in order to try to curb migration. Uh, Biden spearheaded that uh, beginning in 2015. Uh, and, so, and, and, and what's interesting is once Trump took over, um, it was one of the few Obama-era initiatives that he actually didn't get rid of. Uh, so it was a project. So again, this, this is a U.S. interventionist policy. Um, this is where we have the, 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 um, the introduction of Central America being portrayed as the Northern Triangle, which is an extremely militaristic term. Uh, so I always encourage folks not to use that concept of the Northern Triangle, because, again, it, it's within this kind of U.S. interventionist logic that Central America needs saving uh, from the U.S. Uh, so under the, under the Alliance for Prosperity, uh, we've seen increased militarization in Central America, aiding very corrupt uh, Central American presidents. Um, uh, the Honduran president right now, Juan Orlando, um, his brother was uh, convicted of, of, of uh, criminal activity with narco traffickers here in the U.S. He's also been implicated in that. Uh, former President Jimmy Morales, who was being investigated by, for corruption by a U.N. watchdog group called CICIG, um, basically ended CICIG. He hicked them out. Um, he actually used uh, military vehicles donated by the U.S. Department of Defense to intimidate human rights activists um, and other people who were investigating him for corruption. Uh, so I think with Biden, we expect more of the same in terms of U.S. foreign policy in Central America. And finally— um, And unfortunately— Go sorry. ahead, Giovanni. Yeah, and when we think about um, the other—so uh, with Biden, you know, he's going to promote neoliberal policies um, through international investment, which is basically more mega projects and sweat, uh, sweatshops. Um, looking at the case of uh, Palo Viejo, which I investigate, when we think about these mega projects, we always have to ask development for who. Um, in Cozal, where I do my work, only 37 percent of the population has access to electricity. Um, uh, uh, this Palo Viejo hydroelectric plant generates about 30 to 40 million dollars in profits. They only leave less than 300 thousand uh, dollars to the municipality, uh, which is less than a percent. Um, so again, when we think about these mega projects, which the Biden administration will definitely promote, we always have to ask development for who. Who does it benefit? It doesn't benefit indigenous communities, um, and it only benefits corporations.